and uh, we must now move to questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel and can inform members that question six has been withdrawn. I call Mr Roy Beggs. Question number one. <clears throat> Mr Deputy Speaker, the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety was allocated an additional £57 million of resource Dell during the 2013-14 monitoring round process. Uh, I can confirm that there has been no further allocation to the Department after the January monitoring round. Uh, I would expect that the Health Minister should be able to manage his financial pressures to ensure he stays within the budget control totals set by the Executive. And Mr Beggs for supplementary. I, I welcome the belated recognition uh, by the Minister of the considerable financial pressures that exist within our, our health service. However, the Minister has indicated this morning that uh, he might be proposing to remove £68 million from the current year. So my question is, has the Minister considered what the cost would be? Has the Minister and the Executive what the cost would be to patients if £68 million was removed from the health service? Uh, well, look, I mean, principally, if, if we have to proceed down the, the route that I have suggested, which is that um, reductions will have to be made of 1.5% to every department's budget, so every department have to take a 1.5% cut. That does equate to close to £70 million of reductions in terms of the, the health budget's fair share of that. And whilst ultimately, if the executive agrees to go down that route because of non-progress on welfare reform, the, the exact and precise handling of that would be a matter for the health minister. Um, but I'm pretty sure that whatever way the health minister would deal with the reductions of £70 million in a year, and as a member acknowledges, in a budget that is already uh, under pressure, Deputy Speaker, I think the cuts could be, could be devastating uh, for health in terms of what that means for patient care. Um, it is the equivalent, 68 million of a reduction next year is the equivalent of some nearly 12,000 knee procedures. It is just over the equivalent of 10,000 hip procedures. It would be the equivalent of over 115,000 115, weeks in nursing her um, home care for the elderly, and so I could go on and on and on because, as the member I'm sure will appreciate, whatever way you dice and slice up £68 million of reductions in the health budget, it is vulnerable people at the end of the day who will suffer, whether they are elderly people, whether they are people who are waiting for hip replacements or knee replacements, whether it is people who are uh, getting domiciliary care, whatever the service, the impact of not progressing with welfare reform. If we then have to make, if we get those penalties and we have to make those adjustments to the health budget, the impact could be devastating for very vulnerable people here in Northern Ireland. Commissioner Ian McRae. Thank you, Speaker, and can I commend the, the Minister for going on the, the radio this morning and, and outlining the difficulties that um, will come as a result of um, this House not agreeing welfare reform? But can the Minister um, possibly outline? whether he expects any money to actually be surrendered to Her Majesty's Treasury at the year end. In the context of the issue that Mr, uh, Mr. Beggs has raised and, and which he himself touched on, we are obviously losing uh, around £15 million of, of our ability to spend in the last financial year, which ended obviously yesterday and a new one starting today. So there's £15 million that could have been spent on services, including health uh, and social care, and indeed right across the executive's budget that has gone. Um, will be taken off our, our budget. But beyond that, I don't expect, uh, Deputy Speaker, that any other money will be lost uh, to the Treasury. And, and as a member will appreciate, and the House will know from previous updates, uh, over the last particular year, since the introduction of the budget exchange scheme, uh, where we have some flexibility in terms of our ability to roll forward 0.6% uh, in terms of uh, resource expenditure and 1.5% of capital expenditure in year, into the following year. Since the introduction of that scheme, which replaced the old uh, in-year flexibility scheme, we haven't lost any money to Treasury. Um, but of course, um, the inaction and lack of leadership of others within this House has already seen us lose 15 million and risks uh, close to 100 million uh, next year, and indeed uh, close to a billion pounds over the next five years. Thank you, and I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. No, I would say for the for that one. This matter was the subject of discussion at a recent uh, executive committee meeting, and I, along with my colleague, the Minister of the Environment, and the head of the Civil Service, have been asked to prepare a report to the executive on the DVA jobs. 
I have also discussed the situation on a number of occasions with my, the MP for the area, Mr Gregory Campbell. Uh, I can also confirm that my officials are closely working with DOE to establish the details of staff affected by the decision and are collaborating with other departments across the Northern Ireland Civil Service to ensure the effective operation of the policy and procedures to manage staff surpluses, to, to redeploy staff to other duties and to avoid the need for compulsory redundancies. Mr. McKinney, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Is the Minister confident that all of the staff will be redeployed and within a reasonable travel to work area? Well, I, I, was, I was able to catch some of the, uh, the responses of my, my, my colleague, the Minister of the Environment, to similar questions and, and, and topical questions just before my question started. Uh, and I think I, I, I would echo. Uh, what he has said, certainly what I heard um, that he said, and I think it is, you know, I think we need to be exceptionally careful, Deputy Speaker, that we don't build up the hopes of, of I mean, people have had, uh, people who work in Korean and indeed right around Northern Ireland, we mustn't forget that there are other offices where DVA are operating right across Northern Ireland, um, have had such a, a um, bad experience over the last number of weeks. I think it's important that myself and colleagues don't overhype the situation and build up expectation needlessly. We, every effort will be made to redeploy staff within the, uh, elsewhere within either the Department of the Environment or indeed within other departments where work might be available or, as the Minister himself said, maybe move work to Coal Rain. Um, but the member makes a, a very salient point, Deputy Speaker, in terms of the mobility of, of staff, and I think that is going to become an absolutely crucial issue in dealing with this. And, and the member will appreciate there are some staff that are considered mobile within the system, others are considered non-mobile, and it is my understanding, uh, although I appreciate I think a, a survey is being done of the staff by DOE, being carried out by DOE, to um, take a look at and examine the attitudes of staff in, in Korean. Um, but the vast bulk, in fact, the vast majority of um, staff located in coal rain would fall into the non-mobile category, and, and clearly that complicates things much more than if they were mobile. Call Mr. Gregory Campbell. I thank the Minister for his response, um, in, uh, and I agree with him about not unnecessarily raising expectation levels, but in, in discussions that, that he will be having about what can be done, um, will he take account of the fact that 70 per cent of the existing staff there are female, many of them with caring responsibilities, thus restricting their, their mobility, as well as stepping up the campaign to try and get other civil service jobs that are currently not uh, in the coal rain area relocated there? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I, I Deputy Speaker, I agree with the member. Can I, can I com commend him on the swiftness of the contact that he made uh, with me in the aftermath of the, the very bad news a couple of weeks ago? And again, I commend uh, other representatives uh, from the least northern dairy area for, for their efforts as well. Um, uh, the, I, I appreciate that there are the, and I think this is something that is obviously being analysed by DOE at the minute. The sort of complexion of the staff in terms of what their uh, what their mobility is, and even if we consider them uh, sort of officially and technically as non-mobile, just exactly how mobile they are, it is a matter for for DOE to take forward in terms of. Um, what they consider to be the sort of that area, travel to work area that the staff who are based in Corian and the members' constituency would be. And I do think we have to be mindful, as we would be as a, as a considerate employer, of those caring responsibilities that, that people would have. And without trying to build up expectations or, or, or delivering false hope, we will make every effort, uh, both within the Department of the Environment, I know, and my department, and indeed right across the executive. Um, to see whether there are posts available elsewhere, or indeed whether work that is being done elsewhere in Northern Ireland could be uh, done in coal rain um, by the staff who are currently working in DVA. Nicole Sandra Oberland. Minister, um, if it is not possible to redeploy the personnel within the public sector, will the Minister confirm if the compensation scheme which is applied is the current scheme which has the highest benefits? The, uh, the compensation scheme um, is obviously subject to passage through this House and, and, uh, until it goes through the various regulations. I, my understanding is that, that it, it, it doesn't apply until those regulations would go through. But you know, I, I think that we, we shouldn't at this stage be contemplating the worst in terms of redundancies. Uh, I think what we are trying to do, and every effort is going to be made on my part, by the Environment Minister and by indeed other executive colleagues to ensure that we don't get to the situation that the member talks about, or at the very worst, uh, or at the very least, actually, uh, we minimise uh, any number of vacancies or any number of redundancies that might have to take place. I call Mr. Jim Allister. 
Speaker to the House and indeed the workers in Coleraine, has the executive given up the battle to save the DVA office in Coleraine? Is that the conclusion we should reach? And in regard to, if that is so, redeployment, are there any barriers? Are there any barriers to giving priority to the Coleraine workers in redeployment within the civil service? On, on, on the first point, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I think we have got to be somewhat realistic uh, about this point. Uh, it, it is not a matter of. I, mean, I think I, I have to have to say I would commend the staff and the trade union representatives and local representatives, uh, political representatives and community representatives in the East London Dairy area who, um, and further afield who made very sterling representations to make the case to um, the Transport Minister that the people in Coleraine, whilst they were wanting to centralise and wanting to modernise the service, and it's something that, that I have been supportive of in the past, that the distinction be made between the service improvement and where the service actually be carried out. And I think a very robust case was made um, to the Department of Transport that those, that work could be carried out in Coleraine. Unfortunately, that argument fell on deaf ears in respect to the Department of Transport. And I think one has to be somewhat realistic in looking at the prospects of them rowing back from the decision that has been made. If I thought that there was a chink of light that would allow us to uh, allow Department of Transport to re-examine the situation and us to make a robust case for work to be redeployed back there or work to be kept in Coleraine, I would certainly want to seize that, but there is no indication at this stage that, that that's the matter. In terms of giving priority to, to staff from um, DVA, and whilst we are clearly sympathetic to the situation that people find themselves in, we have to be mindful of the, of the law and procedures that are put in place. And at this minute in time, the way uh, the situation works is that uh, staff who are disabled staff who have requirements under the Disability Discrimination Act would actually be top of any priority list for redeployment. Um, then it is staff who have been declared surplus. Uh, and now that might be a bracket in which the staff in, in Coleraine and the, the other offices might fall into, but not until actually DOE takes a decision to declare them surplus, which I don't think is anticipated for another couple of months. Thank you. And I call Mr. Peter Weir. Question number three. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am pleased to say that for the first time since 2010-11, uh, the Executive will start a financial year with a capital budget in excess of £1 billion. Following the recent budget announcement by the Chancellor, our capital Dell budget now stands at £1.04 billion. When we take into consideration planned capital receipts and RRI borrowing, the Northern Ireland Executive Departments are now planning to spend nearly £1.6 billion next year. This will not only provide a huge boost for our construction sector, but will also mean that we can invest in our economy to pr promote faster long-term growth. Where for a supplementary? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his uh, response and the good news that's contained within that. Can I ask the Minister, in light of his recent meeting with the European Investment Bank, uh, whether or not, uh, if he could give us some detail of that, and whether or not their funding could assist uh, in our capital spend? Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for, for his supplementary question. I, I did indeed have a very um, productive engagement uh, last week with uh, senior officials from the European Investment Bank, and um, I think it is fair to say they are incredibly keen uh, to do more business in Northern Ireland, uh, to build on the uh, very successful uh, loan that they have given to the University of Ulster to allow it to relocate to the, uh, its Jordanstown campus to the, or the bulk of its Jordanstown campus to the centre of Belfast, some uh, 150 million pounds of a loan that was given them that. They are very keen to build on that. I think there are other opportunities across a range of uh, infrastructure areas that we might be able to avail of in terms of funding from the European Investment Bank. Uh, I think a, a note of caution is, though, um, required in that there may be a perception that we can put this sort of money into, for example, road infrastructure or hospital or schools infrastructure. Um, we certainly could, uh, but there are ramifications elsewhere in the budget of just going and getting European Investment Bank funding in terms of having to pay back a loan. Um, the money that could be raised, I think I've mentioned this in response to Mr Cree in the past, um, the money that we would raise via a loan would have to score uh, on our budget, um, and we would have to and would, would see a commensurate drop in our capital budget coming from Treasury, and we would also have interest to repay on any loan. So we have to be incredibly careful where we would, re or where we would deploy 
uh, any finance that we were to get from the European Investment Bank, but I'm very keen to follow up on the positive engagement last week and scope out what other opportunities might be there. I got a previous last kind of Can I thank the Minister uh, for his answer and in particular his comments in regard to the European uh, Investment Bank? Can I ask the Minister, uh, in terms of uh, delivery uh, out of possible uh, projects coming out of the EIB, uh, do you see anything in the short to medium term that will impact in terms of our economic recovery? Uh, and also, what opportunities does he see in terms of working with the new councils uh, to try and draw down some of those funds from the EIB? Well, there, there are some, and we had a, a good discussion about uh, some projects that, that are already sort of working their way through the early stages of the, the pipeline, um, uh, and ones that would have a very positive impact on uh, the economy in Northern Ireland. So a lot of energy infrastructure projects are already being discussed uh, between uh, sort of network and grid companies and directly with um, EIA, uh, EIB. And that underscores the point, Deputy Speaker, that it isn't just central government trying to raise money, perhaps using the uh, European Investment Bank. This is money that is available to the, the private sector or the non-public sector as well. So I'd be very encouraging of those energy companies in trying to take up that opportunity that, that might well be there. Um, obviously, there's a range, a huge range of, of experience right across elsewhere in Ireland, the United Kingdom, um, right across the European Union. So there are opportunities for energy that can be availed on, I think, quite, quite quickly through the European Investment Bank. The member is right to highlight the uh, opportunity that is presented by our local councils, particularly after uh, reorganisation and the RPA, which will of course create much bigger councils with bigger rate bases uh, and also uh, change in better borrowing powers uh, and importantly more powers, including the power of regeneration. Um, I had a meeting with, uh, held a seminar in the department a couple of weeks ago with um, senior officials, chief executives and finance directors from a large number of the local councils. Uh, I'm continue to, uh, I will keen to continue that type of engagement to try to make them aware of the opportunities that EIB funding potentially presents, and also financial transactions, capital funding. And I think into the future, our councils, given their greater powers post uh, RPA, um, should be an increasing driver of infrastructure investment in Northern Ireland. And I'm keen at these early stages to use the good offices of the Department of uh, Finance and Personnel to encourage them down that path. Comes to John Dallet. Deputy Speaker, I was listening carefully to the Minister. £1 billion pounds is a lot of money, enough to make the, the Minister as popular as Santa Claus. Uh, could I ask the Minister, does this mean there might be some additional funding for new schools that are badly needed? Well, I, I think the. To, to reiterate the point that was made to Mr. Weir, Deputy Speaker, I think we could certainly. Um, use the money from, say, the European Investment Bank or indeed from other sources to, in, in the, the, the private markets to invest in schools infrastructure just as we could in roads or, or health. The complicating factor comes in that you know, that would be projects, if you take schools, taken forward by our education minister. The way that is treated in terms of our budget actually means that it would have to be in a sort of a, a private finance initiative type format, which is actually quite expensive at the minute. Uh, and would obviously require the expenditure of, of, of current funds to your current and resource expenditure to pay back the interest over sort of 20, 25 years or whatever the term might be. And at the minute, our budget is tight, as a member will appreciate, in terms of cuts coming from London and particularly focused on our current expenditure budget. So at this minute in time, both with the price and, and the reducing current expenditure budget, it is not as attractive an option as it might have been 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and that doesn't mean that it might not come back in, in vogue in the, in the longer term. I suppose with the benefit of accessing funding from perhaps the European Investment Bank or indeed from others is, is that it will if we can fund some of those projects that we might have done ourselves through central government funds, capital funds, and that is done perhaps through local government, to pick up on the previous member's point, that might release some funds that we have in our conventional capital budget to instead then spend on new schools or new hospitals, new healthcare centres or uh, new road infrastructure. So it might free up some resources elsewhere that we could deploy for some of the projects the member talks about. The comments are Michael Copeland. Thank you very much. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I too thank the Minister for his, answer, his answers thus far. Uh, could he confirm what provision, if any, has been built into the capital budgets that should a major project not be in a position to proceed, then a further range of projects could be at an advanced stage in order that they may proceed? 
It's a very good point that the, the member makes, Deputy Speaker, and, and one that I'm uh, increasingly mindful of. Um, we have had, obviously, recent experience with the, the A5 not moving forward, probably the biggest road project I think that we've ever undertaken in Northern Ireland, and uh, not proceeding then, so over £200 million then suddenly released uh, to have to be spent on capital projects. Now, thankfully, we did have, through a, a, a trawl that was undertaken last year with other departments, Deputy Speaker, have some good projects to spend that money on. I can think uh, primarily of the, um, the A26 um, um, extension. Um, very good project, which I see is underway at this minute in time, um, and the uh, new regional children's hospital at the Royal Victoria Hospital site in Belfast was another project that was able to spend some of that money. There were other projects too, but those are two, two of the biggest projects. Um, and we were fortunate that we had those projects to spend it on. They were sufficiently advanced that the money could be spent in the time that we wanted it to be spent in. But the member is right to highlight that you know, if such an event an eventuality happened again, if the executive did not have other projects like that that were sort of down the line um, that we could hasten them up and bring them forward, we could be in a position where uh, capital money might actually be at risk of being lost and going back to Treasury. So with that in mind, I have asked, asked a subgroup of the Procurement Board to look at a whole range of issues in respect of the, the delivery of major capital projects. And on this particular issue, I, I would favour an approach where um, the executive as a whole takes a decision to prioritise certain projects. And that will, that will be difficult and that will create some political difficulties as well, I'm sure. But I think in terms of addressing the type of problem that the member identifies, we absolutely need to have projects that are down the line or procurement ready and that if such an eventuality arises or we get actually more money coming from Treasury, we can start to spend the money and get good projects on the ground. Call Mr. Ian Mung. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have no responsibility for NAMA's activities and cannot account for or report on its activities. Moment for supplementary. Could I ask the Minister, I hear what he has said about uh, has no um, contact, but could I ask him to contact, uh, maybe have regular contact with NAMA in the months ahead to ensure the risk of fire sale? Um, or any decisions which might uh, adversely affect the economy in the north are minimised? Yeah, I think the, the point that the, the member makes is a, is a good point. Uh, I'm not responsible for the day-to-day -day operations uh, or indeed any operations uh, for NAMA. It's perhaps a, a question best put by one of his colleagues in Doyle Aaron to uh, um, uh, re the relevant minister down there. But I do have um, obviously an interest in it and keep a uh, continual interest in, in NAMA and what NAMA is doing in Northern Ireland. Um, and I agree, and I agree with comments that were made by the Secretary of State as well today, that we have got to avoid the possibility of a fire sale from, from happening. That was a big fear that many of us had when NAMA was created a number of years ago. Thankfully, that hasn't materialised, uh, although I do think that there is, um, there is a danger moving forward as NAMA's own mandate starts to run out towards the end of this decade that we may see um, less benign situations uh, over the next couple of years. And you, the member has my absolute assurance, as does the House, that I will keep in regular contact, uh, as I do with the Chairman of NAMA and the Northern Ireland Advisory Committee, to ensure that the, the very situation that the member outlined does not happen. Call Mr. McGloan. Uh, I'm good to for you, last uh, call you. Um, could, could I ask the Minister, just as the custodian of the public purse, um, what efforts he, through his department, has made to nurture links between not only um, his department, but also uh, through NAMA with the likes of DSD to ensure that where there are reasonably priced sites for the, the likes of social housing development, that those opportunities are availed of? But I think the, it, is, it is my understanding that um, part of NAMA's remit or constitution or um, uh, however one would, would describe it properly is to have a, a sort of a social aspect or conscience to, to, to what the work that it is doing and I know that it has been actively and certainly the conversations that I have had with NAMA it has been an issue that has been raised actually by the chairman with me that they are very keen to look at uh, a range of sites in Northern Ireland where social housing could be developed and I think there is one in North Belfast, which they have already taken forward. Um, they've also done some private housing development, and um, I think they've put about £140 million into assets that they have in Northern Ireland to 
build them out or to start construction so that value is added to the, to the site. Uh, and obviously that includes um, social housing potentially as well. And um, We see uh, with Clan Mill's announcement today of £120 million pounds of a loan from Danske Bank and from Barclays Bank that it is a sector that is quite buoyant. It is attracting investment from the private market, from banks and financial institutions. So I'm sure that NAMA would be very conscious of that and see it as a, a, an opportunity, not just to tick that box in their constitution, but also to get a good return for them. I call Lord Morrow. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I've listened carefully to what the Minister's had to say. I'd like to just take him a wee bit further on this one. Uh, could he tell us, explain to the House today, what is the relationship between NAMA and the Department of Finance? Here? Thank Lord Morrow for his, for his question. Um, as, I, as I pointed out to the original questioner in this, I am I'm not responsible for NAMA, nor do I want to be, I have to say. Um, uh, I think that's well understood. Um, I don't envy anybody who is, um, but you know it is absolutely essential for me or anybody who holds this post to have a very good relationship with NAMA, and that was certainly something that my predecessor, who was minister at the time whenever it was created, um, used his good relationship with Brian Lenehan, the late Brian Lenehan, who was then finance minister in the Irish Republic, to ensure that Northern Ireland's interests were at the forefront of what NAMA were, were doing. Uh, and I think that because of that, that initial fear, Deputy Speaker, that we had that there would be a fire sale. I think that was the, the risk that many of us feared would, would be the case because here is a, an organisation which is in another jurisdiction, has no particular concern. That's maybe somebody from NAMA on the phone there looking to make maybe a bit of news for us. I don't know. Um, that, was this, somebody has just sold something or bought something. Um, the, uh, that the, the, <laughs> The, the risk would be that because they have no, authority, no say in this jurisdiction that they would just sell the assets here and get, whatever, get a fast buck. That hasn't been the case, I think, because of that good relationship. As I say, I do meet with the, the chair regularly. I meet with the Northern Ireland Advisory Committee. Uh, and I think that engagement, is which we have developed over the last couple of years, is particularly vital moving forward. Because, as I alluded to earlier, I think that we are getting towards what could be described as the business end of what NAMA does. And they have themselves perhaps been scoping out possibilities over the first couple of years. We're now getting into a phase, I think, where they are going to have to start to realise the value in some of their assets. And I suppose my concern is that as that starts to happen over the next number of years, that whilst we haven't had maybe some of the horror stories that we feared, we might start to hear some of those coming through because NAM is having to do its job and to wind down its operations by the end of this decade. So I think, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's important that, that nothing is done. To, uh, I think, and this is a view I think that is shared right around the house. Nothing is done with Northern Ireland, with individuals, or with the overall Northern Ireland portfolio that would upset that hard-earned, positive relationship that we've developed over the last number of years. No, that was a very important topic, but uh, the two-minute rule does apply. Mr. David McNary, Principal Deputy Speaker, I wonder um, would the minister share any concerns he may have? about the possibility of hedge funders uh, taking over the, the, the NAMA property uh, in Northern Ireland and whether or not uh, those concerns would, would lead him to be worried about a fire sale, which we've all been very anxious about, wouldn't happen uh, under NAMA. I mean, there, there, there is a well-publicised um, process underway where NAMA have gone to the market to test the market about the, the overall Northern Ireland portfolio. And I've only seen one name in terms of a potential buyer attached to that process. I'm not aware of what other buyers may or may not be interested and whether or not they are, as a member describes, hedge funds. The one um, firm that I did see associated with it in public domain was a, an insurance firm. And I think actually rather than, and if, that, if, if an insurance firm or another insurance firm or, firm indeed or, or a pension fund investor was successful, I think quite the opposite of what the, the member is concerned about and what the rest of us would be concerned about. I think instead of, of seeing what might happen over the next number of years, which is NAMA, start to try to crystallise those assets and get assets out the door much quicker than the market might be ready for, an insurance firm or a, um, you know, the investment arm of an insurance company or a pension fund might actually take a much longer view because, as the member will appreciate, they do tend to take that longer-term view. They're investing um, proceeds from pension, their insurance, um, to get a return over a much longer period of time. They're not in it for that fast buck that I talked about. So, in, a, in actual fact, it may be quite a positive thing if the asset or the portfolio was sold to a company of that kind. But I, you know, I appreciate that there could be some buyers out there 
who uh, would be less desirable, um, either because of they want to flip the things very quickly or they actually don't have the quantum of assets in their own balance sheet to um, add value to some of the assets that are here in Northern Ireland. Thank you. And uh, that brings us to the end of the period for oral questions. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Cahill Boylan. Carmaga, Prev. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Prince, Deputy Speaker. But could I put it to the Minister, given that Scotland are not afraid to challenge the Treasury in, in terms of economic data, uh, why does the Minister's party seem to be holding back and pushing for this information? Um, things that, you know, if you got this information, it definitely would benefit the local economy. Can, can, can I begin by sympathising with the member? I think this is about the third or fourth time that he has been drawn for a topical question to me. Um, I'm sure his, he cringes every time his name is drawn. Um, look, I, I think that, you know, I, and I know there's been some, some conversation um, about this over the last number of days, about the quality of the economic data that we produce in, in Northern Ireland. Um, you know, the, I, I think it's, it's, it's fair and true to say, Deputy Speaker, that the, both the timeliness and the quality of the economic data uh, that we produce in Northern Ireland is similar, if not actually better, than most of the other jurisdictions and regions within the United Kingdom. Uh, a wide range of official statistics from Northern economic statistics from Northern Ireland have been independently assessed and designated as national statistics. Um, there are a broad range of, of uh, publications that we do make, and we always will try to make those as uh, accurate as we possibly can. Um, and, and I have to say, Treasury, who are ultimately responsible for taxation, do not routinely publish actual regional tax da data. My department does produce estimates of regional tax revenues as part of the net fiscal balance report, and, and there is only ourselves, Deputy Speaker, and the Scots who actually produce that. And the methodology that we use to produce our net fiscal balance report is very similar to the Scottish equivalent. Uh, it's something that Wales don't do, it's something that the no English region does. So, in many respects, rather than catching up with where the Scots are, we are uh, absolutely in tune with what they are doing. Mr. Boylan, for supplementary. Gorm Hoggett, and, and I don't mind being up to ask the Finance Minister any question to you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, but could ask, given that um, you continue to abuse the fiscal uh, report, um, balance report, is it not about time that we will get proper economic data, Minister? And when are you going to push to get proper economic data? I don't accept every speaker the premise that we don't have proper economic data. We are not responsible for a lot of the data, particularly as I mentioned, the, the tax data that is, that is there. Uh, a point acknowledged by the, um, Mr. Mackay, the chairman of the Finance Committee, who um, had a sort of slightly mysterious situation last week where he had a press statement out that attacked DFP initially. That was then replaced on his party's website by one that was attacking Treasury principally, and I do think that he is right. To, uh, they're not both there. If you remember, wants to check. They're, 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 one has been replaced by the other, which was a, a, a sort of a, an interesting U-turn over a 24-hour period by the member. But he is right. He is right to turn his attention principally towards uh, Treasury, who, at the end of the day, given that the national government um, are the recipients of most of this data, so we are very reliant on them to produce some of this data. But we make the best effort that we possibly can, in a way consistent with what. For example, the Scottish do as well, and I do I would have to point out to the member and to, to his party colleagues that you know this is the same data on which his party and my party, indeed other parties in this place, are, are content to proceed um, to pursue the devolution of corporation tax to this place. So it's good enough to pursue that policy, but yet for sometimes whatever it doesn't suit Sinn Féin's agenda, it doesn't seem suitable. Thank you, and I call Ms. Brownman McGahan. Figures from the, the Land and Property Services show that there are 1,520 vacant domestic properties within the Dungannon district. Has the Minister had any discussion with other Ministers, including the DSD Ministers, so that many of these uh, properties may be retrofitted in order to address the housing shortage in this area? I, I haven't had any uh, direct discussions. Um, Deputy Speaker, with any other ministers about the, the point that the, the member raises, but uh, I'm content to, to do so. Um, I, I, I wouldn't accept, though, that probably all of those 1,520 properties would require a degree of work to, to make them accessible. Um, very you know, content to work, and she's right, it's probably more a, a DSD issue primarily in terms of housing allocations, but you know, more than happy to do whatever we can through LPS um, if required to work with DSD to 
Um, I suppose highlight the opportunities that there are there for the owners of those properties to get those properties let and into operation, which is obviously of financial benefit potentially to them. Ms. McGahan for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response. Is the Minister uh, aware of the scale of this problem right across the North in terms of vacant domestic properties? I, think there, there, I, I am. I mean, I think there is. A, I, mean, I don't have the pre precise figures in front of me, and I can certainly furnish the member with those, indeed, the whole House. Um, and I do think it, it is. In the, I, mean, I can recall an exercise being done a few years ago in advance of the rating of uh, empty domestic properties to identify what was the precise number, and it was a, an issue that DSD were involved in, and it was a sort of a, a movable face, and the number fluctuated up and down. Um, I think there are clearly there are ramifications coming from the downturn and the recession, the pressure that has put on people, why there are many more uh, vacant properties, and not just in terms of people vacating them themselves, but also um, buy to let properties, which are, 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 are um, not as, haven't been perhaps as attractive in some areas as they were in the past. Um, and, and clearly, we don't want to see, I think, given the potential that there is for those houses to be let, uh, perhaps to social housing tenants, it's not something that we want to see um, sort of sitting lying there and not, not um, maximising. I'm sure that's something that as part of the housing strategy, the uh, Minister for Social Development is looking at carefully. Thank you. And I call Mr. Michael Copeland. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number three. After last week. <laughs> I, I do most profoundly and sincerely apologise. Uh, Minister, are there any provisions arising from the budget which will affect civil service pay in Northern Ireland? Um, there are, I was just going to say yes to the first one, but um, the, the um, guidance has been issued by uh, Treasury uh, in terms of 14 15 financial year um, uh, pay restraint for civil servants, and they are, uh, I understand the advice is that it is uh, 1% for public servants. And obviously, we don't have to um, follow that strictly. We have previously mirrored what has been done in respect of the UK, and, and I still consider this issue in discussions with officials. Mr. Copeland, for supplementary to question number three. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, given the Minister's comments about mirroring, of, uh, mirroring events in uh, GB, uh, and the fact that um, there is some chatter there about consideration being given to re removing progression pay. Is that under consideration here as well? It, it, it is. Any, I, I mean, I've heard the Chancellor at this uh, a couple of times. Um, this isn't the first time that this has been talked about. I think in last year's uh, budget statement, they also talked about uh, looking at progression. And this is where, in addition to whatever uh, increase there is to pay, civil servants move up uh, various stages within their, their current grade, and, and that happens as a sort of a matter of, of course. And their pay goes up um, uh, accordingly. Um, and you know, look, I think it's, it's, it's something that the uh, coalition government are keen to look at, obviously driven by an agenda of reducing costs um, right across the board. Um, it would have ramifications for Northern Ireland, but uh, certainly it has been an issue that has been discussed at, at Finance Minister Quadrilaterals along with our Scottish and Welsh counterparts. And um, the legal advice that I have, uh, my department has received, similarly I think in Scotland and Wales, has suggested that um, progression pay is part of the contractual obligations that we have to, to civil servants and is therefore uh, not easy to get rid of, as perhaps the Chancellor might think it is. Thank you, Ms. Michelle Michael Dean. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what discussions he has had with local banks in recent weeks? I, I meet with um, um, our local banks um, regularly, both formally and informally. I suppose it was even this morning, I was sort of informally chatting to uh, officials from both Danske Bank and Barclays Bank at the announcement of their the £120 million loan to um, Clanwell Housing Association. Uh, Minister Foster and I have, have recently concluded our latest round of meetings with um, all of the sort of big four local banks, as well as um, Santander, Barclays, and HSBC. And uh, as recently as last Wednesday, um, uh, as part of the uh, latest meeting of the Joint Ministerial Task Force, um, a meeting in London along with the um, Secretary of State, myself, Minister Foster, Secretary of State. Um, Business Minister Matthew Hancock and Treasury Minister Sajid Javid. We met with uh, officials from the British Bankers Association. Ms. McElveen for supplementary. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And I am aware that he has been pressing um, local banks to provide him with better lending data. Can I ask the Minister if any progress has been made um, in recent times in acquiring this? There's, I mean, th this has been a sort of a long-standing problem, Deputy Speaker. In fact, you probably recall it uh, from, from the, and you will recall it from the Finance Committee. Um, the problem was in the past we had absolutely no sight of any data about, about lending in Northern Ireland. Um, more recently, the, the British Bankers Association, who had a conversation with last week, have provided um, the executive on a confidential basis very high-level data around uh, new lending, average loan values, and approval rates. And um, what we have actually seen, whilst I'm not allowed to divulge the precise figures within that, that has all started to deputy speaker over the last uh, quarter started to move in a positive direction. So it, it is a sign that um, the banking system is at least starting to work. Um, better than it has in the past. We have been pushing in more recent times, and I think I have reported this house before, that we have been pushing for sectoral data, so lending to various sectors of the economy in Northern Ireland. Um, and I was concerned that very slow progress was, was being made in that regard. But I am happy to confirm to the member to the House that um, the BBA presented to the Joint Ministerial Task Force last week an enhanced data set and an improved um, set of statistics, which included sectoral lending. And it also extended the, the figures, which had just been for the four main local banks, to also include Barclays, HSBC, and Santander's lendings in Northern Ireland. Um, and it is, and again, I'm glad to be able to say that they are, it is their intention, after some refinement, uh, to publish that data. Uh, publicly um, before the summer, and I think that will be most helpful to us as an executive in terms of directing policy and interventions that we want, might want to make in terms of an, an increasing SME lending, and it will also give us all a better sign of how well the banking system in Northern Ireland is doing. Thank you. And, and Mr Paul Gervin is not in this place, so I call Mr Dahi Mackay. I got a brief ask and clear. Minister, in the recent budget announcement, the British government again failed to deliver uh, what we need uh, in terms of air passenger journey. Uh, and can I ask you, will you now seek the transfer uh, of these powers and prevent other airports on this island continuing to have an unfair tourism advantage over airports in the north and indeed the tourist operators? The, the member will, will well know, um, Deputy Speaker, that a uh, air connectivity study has been undertaken in conjunction between my department and the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And, you know, the, the point of, of conducting studies like this is to scope out the range of options that may be available, the possible way forward, what the consequences of doing it are, both in terms of budget uh, and obviously uh, as perhaps a downside and maybe some of the benefits of it. And in advance of um, seeing that report, I don't want to commit myself to one position one way or another. Thank you. And I call Mr McKay for a supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer, but the review that is ongoing has been ongoing for a considerable period of time. It seems to be one of those reviews that takes place just to put off uh, making a decision. Does the Minister not recognise that we in the North will continue to lag behind, whilst both he uh, and indeed the Deputy Minister as well uh, fiddle their fingers rather than deal with the issue of air passengers? Today? Because whilst this isn't in place, we are not getting revenue from tourism, which would be coming in uh, if it was the case that we had a, a single policy across this island. Well, the member, the member will well know that, you know, far from filling our fingers, um, we have already devolved our passenger duty for direct long-haul flights into Northern Ireland, and in so doing, securing not just a tourist route uh, direct into North America, but as actually one that is critically important for business investment in Northern Ireland. It is one of the factors amongst many factors why firms like City and Allstate and New York Stock Exchange have not just a presence in Northern Ireland, but a growing presence in Northern Ireland. And, you know, it is easy for the member, and you know, I am sure some of his party colleagues in Dublin will be uh, less than complimentary about the, the language that he has chosen to um, declare about, um, about the competitor airports south of the border. Um, but you know, it is easy for him to sit and say, just devolve this and to hell with it. There are consequences of devolving it, consequences which people in my position, people in the Enterprise Minister's position, have to consider very, very carefully. And one of the primary considerations that I have to consider in the position as Finance Minister is the fact 
that devolving um, air passenger duty for band A flights, which are those sort of short haul flights, comes at a price. It's not a pain free or price free option. It comes at a price of 60 million initially rising in the next number of years to 90 million. And at a time, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when we have already lost uh, 15 million pounds to our budget because of Sinn Féin fiddling its fingers in respect of welfare reform, when we face reductions of close to 100 million pounds this year because of non-progress on welfare reform because Sinn Féin is fiddling its fingers. Where would the member then want to find the additional £60 million for reducing um, our budget because of the evolving APD? You know, it is easy for the member to ask for these things, much more difficult for him to come up with the answers as to how we are going to pay for it. Order. Time is up. Uh